Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. We begin today's program with the global efforts to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. More than half a million people now have been infected in over 170 countries and regions. Over 24,000 people have died. The United States now has more infections than any other country. And even Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, tested positive. Chinese President Xi Jinping has spoken on the phone with his U.S. counterpart Donald Trump about rising coronavirus infections. President Xi from China said that China has been open and transparent in clamping down on COVID-19 and is willing to offer support to the U.S. Mr. Trump later tweeted their discussion was in great detail and the U.S. was working closely with China. G20 leaders earlier met in a historic tele-summit to discuss ways of containing coronavirus. So why should China and the U.S. step out cooperation and help realize each other's potential? For answers, earlier I talked to Zheng Guang, the chief epidemiologist at the China CDC. He said the virus was the common enemy. About international cooperation. Now, virus, as we said, respect no borders. So what about the current stage of international cooperation? COVID-19 is a challenge for humankind. It's a bad thing, but I hope we can turn it into a good thing. I hope we can stop wars, stop the trade war, stop arguing over something without a conclusion. We can work together against the virus and realize our potential. What is China's potential? Since we first dealt with SARS, the Chinese people had a very rational approach. We built the Shaotangshan Hospital for specifically treating SARS. The Shaotangshan Hospital model was later used in Africa against Ebola. And this time, Hua Shanshan Hospital and Lei Shanshan Hospital in Wuhan and mobile hospitals are all built based on the Shaotangshan model. Now it has also been applied in foreign countries. We Chinese always have an overall picture in our mind. In my opinion, I believe the Chinese people are no worse than those in any other country in disease research and prevention. But many of our experiences have not been adopted. For example, our experience in China's epidemiological investigation into SARS. It is the largest epidemiologic investigation in the history of mankind. Many countries don't have the ability to do it now. And why are there many countries thinking about herd immunity? They're all scared by the reproductive number R0. At the beginning, some people in China also said, based on R0, it is impossible to prevent and control. These people have no field experience. It's called SOFA epidemiology. They're studying epidemiology without going to the epicenter and fighting along with decision makers. They just sit on the sofa in front of the computer and work out a few parameters. What are the advantages of the United States? Wealth, isn't it? They have a good public health system and are leading in biomedical research. The U.S. CDC has a staff number more than 10 times that of ours. They have 26,000 people and we only have 2,100. They're very good at general epidemiological investigation, but lack experience in big epidemics. No one has taught them to contain widespread outbreaks. Do you think there will be vicious competition in terms of drug and vaccine development between China and the U.S.? I don't agree with anyone who thinks it's a vicious competition. I think this is what we call hand-in-hand. Whoever goes ahead in developing drugs and vaccines, it's a victory for mankind. Why? Because our common enemy is the virus. It's the virus that's the enemy. Americans have all reasons to go full steam ahead in drugs and vaccines. Look at how serious the epidemic is in the U.S. And look at how difficult it is to carry out social distancing. Don't they need to develop the vaccines? They're in desperate need of it.
How can China and the U.S. cooperate in the future? I think it's a pity that the potential of the U.S. CDC hasn't been fully realized this time. As always, they've been leading the global fight against many infectious diseases like Ebola and MERS. Since the fight to eliminate smallpox, they have been the leader. But this time, they failed to lead. But how can you reach the Americans? Are you talking to Dr. Anthony Fauci or President Trump? I have received information. Some important U.S. experts and officials, they want to hear about China's experience. Will you help them? I think I will. Even though they have now reduced cooperation in emerging infectious diseases projects and have been withdrawing offices from China, they have helped us train so many talents before. Now they have difficulties. I think we should help them. You know, some people might ask, why should we help them? Because this virus is our common enemy. I hope amid this crisis we can turn risks into opportunity. I hope we can make such attempts which are good for China good for the United States and good for all mankind. Why don't we try to do this kind of things? So if you work hard together, we can achieve that. The Americans are facing great difficulties now. Maybe they're not in that desperate situation, or at least they're beset with difficulties. Why don't we sincerely lend a hand? It's good for China as well, because if other countries are still suffering from coronavirus, China will not be safe either. Remember polio. Even though there are only two countries now with the polio virus, people all over the world have to be vaccinated every year. So China's fight against COVID-19 won't end on its own. I think when the U.S. contains the spread on its continent, then it can join China to help other countries. We should not blame each other. We should set aside prejudice. Maybe, after we win the war against COVID-19, we'll have a new type of relations between countries, between people. I think that's what we're looking for. As COVID-19 infections outside China surge, Chinese authorities announced on Friday a temporary ban on most foreigners coming into the mainland with a drastic cut in the number of international flights. But people's worries do not stop at infections from abroad. As lockdowns ease, what's key to preventing a resurgence? My conversation with Professor Zeng Guang, the chief epidemiologist at the China CDC, continues. <music> Professor Zeng, now China was first in the fire. Apparently, China is getting much better. We could even claim the lockdown comes to an end. But elsewhere in the world, they were struggling, they are struggling. But it doesn't mean we wouldn't have the quote unquote opportunity to come back to the fire again, because this is the virus we're talking about. It respects no borders. So what does that mean to a public health scholar like you? What kind of policy is the best one? There's no challenge that is so big that we cannot overcome. When a new situation emerges, we come up with a new strategy. The darkest hour has passed for China. The road ahead will not be tougher than the road we already walked. It will not be harder than what we experienced in the very beginning of the epidemic. Right now, we are focusing on preventing imported cases. This is not as hard as when we had to lock down Wuhan in the beginning. Are we going to close the border? Should we not have any airplanes? Landed here in China? I think this issue requires detailed analysis. If anyone can give you a one-line answer to this question, in my opinion, they are being irresponsible. Among all the possibilities now for the next stage of control and prevention, which is the most crucial, Professor? I think we ought to distinguish the difference between scientific studies and disease prevention measures. Let's take a look at how China reached its turning point in this outbreak. For us, the turning point emerged around February 5th. From there on, you see a clear downward trend of new cases. 
So yes, there is the issue of transmission during the incubation period. There are asymptomatic infections and we see news about recovered patients who test positive again. But none of these issues stopped the steady decline of new cases. The curve went down regardless. So by looking at the data, we can be certain that the outbreak is on the wane, despite some lingering uncertainties. For us epidemiologists, we don't feel scared. Now we do not have lockdowns anymore. That was earlier under the condition of lockdowns. I think the situation is under control now, even without the lockdowns. When I explain to people why I'm not worried, I often use the Ebola outbreak in West Africa as an example. West Africa is not perfectly prepared for epidemic outbreak. But after they contained Ebola the first time, when Ebola broke out again, they were able to contain the epidemic very quickly. Why is that? What changed in West Africa after their first outbreak? The most important thing that changed is their monitoring ability. Monitoring is the key. Once you have the ability to spot the outbreak quickly, you can contain it. So for China, be it the new cases are imported or not, as long as we can monitor and identify them in a timely fashion, we have it under control. We now have more than 500 imported cases of COVID-19. Among these, only a few have then infected others within China. The vast majority of imported cases didn't result in secondary transmissions, or if more transmissions even took place. As long as we know exactly how the infections happen, we are entirely capable of controlling the spread of the virus. No, no, of course not. Lockdown won't be necessary. We can quarantine on a much smaller scale. For example, in cities, we only lock down a unit, not even the entire compound. And when we quarantine the unit, we don't publicize which apartment was infected so that privacy is not invaded when not necessary. What we do now is to contain the epidemic at a relatively small cost. At this stage, it is highly unlikely for an epidemic to break out again. Say our society is a forest. Maybe one tree catches fire, a few trees catch fire, but there is absolutely no possibility for a forest fire to break out. It is impossible for things to get out of control again, because right now in China, from people to government to the public health system, everyone is keeping a very close eye on things. We should have confidence in ourselves. Lockdown has come to an end, at least for the city of Wuhan. But many wonder whether this is only temporarily. We have done a lot and paid a very high price to get to where we are now in terms of fighting this epidemic. But we also have seen the side effect. So from the public health perspective, while we are fighting one epidemic, other risks are accumulating. At this stage, our considerations need to be more comprehensive. We need to be smart and utilize the epidemiological monitoring information we have to prevent a second wave of outbreak at the minimum cost, instead of taking costly large-scale actions. There are other examples, they say, not only China's, but also that of Singapore, that of South Korea. Apparently, they all have some kinds of control of the epidemic. I think what we are seeing in places near China are somewhat expected. South Korea and Japan are our close neighbors, so they also acted relatively quickly. They took advantage of seeing what happened in China in the very beginning, so they skipped that initial painful discovery phase we had to go through. They took the chance and acted early on. So even if their measures are not particularly strict, they achieved some good results. But we should note that they are taking a different containment approach than us. Their measures have resulted in a state of low infection. It is a continuous state, but it is not stable. They have reached a state where their hospitals have the capacity to handle the cases. They have enough beds to receive new patients as old patients recover. The pressure is low. But it looks like the situation might be changing in Korea. They might be building their versions of temporary hospitals now. I think when the danger of an epidemic outbreak is approaching, we who are working in public health have a more acute sense of it. For most people in society, including government officials, it is not something that they normally think about. But what we need is that when they do come into contact with it, they become alert immediately. Alert. They believe what we say. I've been working in public health for five decades and have had my fair share of interacting with government officials. If governing was like playing a piano, 
then managing public health crisis is a key that they seldom hit. Times like this, it is our job, public health advisors, to say to officials, it is time to hit that key. It is time to hit that key hard. We must do it now. If we don't pay great attention to public health safety, then the loss could be unprecedented.